Welcome to the first panel of the 28th Annual Animal Law Conference, Animals in a Changing Climate, Science, Ethics, and Policy. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, I would like to thank our silver sponsor, Tofurkey. The session will include pre-recorded presentations followed by a live Q&A with our panelists. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. They all have truly impressive resumes, so I encourage you to read their bios. Uh, right now, in the interest of time and hearing more from them and less from me, I'm going to just hit some of the highlights. Um, Dr. Rod Benison has been involved in animal protection for more than four decades, including as an academic, as chair of Minding Animals International, uh, whose fifth conference next year will also focus on animals and climate change. And he manages a team of environmental scientists in an engineering and environmental consulting firm. Dr. Lisa Benjamin is my colleague at Lewis and Clark Law School, where she is an assistant professor specializing in international climate change law, energy resource law and policy, and environmental justice. And Jeff Sebo has a series of titles a mile long at NYU, including that he directs the Animal Law, oh, sorry, Animal Studies MA program. His research focuses on bioethics, animal ethics, and environmental eth ethics, and he's written a number of books on these topics, including his forthcoming book, Why Animals Matter for Climate Change. We'll begin with a presentation from Dr. Rod Benison. Firstly, let me thank the organisers of this conference, not an easy task given the dire situation with the pandemic. And greetings from Australia, and let me say that I would like to begin by acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm presenting my talk today. That's the people of the Wanarua Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. Similarly, I'd like to also acknowledge the local First Nations and peoples from where people are watching. And let me emphasise that the people of the Western states that have had tremendous loss of life and property and nature during this wildfire season. Speaking from New South Wales and Australia, we too suffered great loss in our summer over the Christmas and New Year period nine months ago. But more of this later. So this is a fairly wide ranging paper, which and I have much to say in a limited time available. So let me start off by stating that the Earth's Natural systems are in three fall, and the planet's human population is in complete denial as we stand at the precipice of massive, massive environmental destruction and ecosystem annihilation, so much so that the stability and resilience of the Earth itself is in peril. As you are all aware, and many times in its history, the Earth has experienced environmental disruptions that resulted in mass extinction events. I'm sure that you are all in agreement that the most recent extinction events is being exacerbated by the direct actions of humans in what is becoming popularly and somewhat self-importantly ascribed as the Anthropocene. The imp impacts that have become critical to life itself with multiple species extinctions, ecosystem degradation with an increased regularity in a number of major environmental calamities. Many species are now becoming extinct, such as for Christmas Island Pipistrelle, as we see here in the Australian Indian Ocean Territory. Obviously, what makes this current extinction event so critical to life on Earth is the extraordinarily rapid escalation of a problem. In September, the WWF and Zoological Society of London announced in the latest Living Planet Index that the key drivers behind a 68% average decline in vertebrate population since 1970 is due to unprecedented economic growth, overconsumption, increasing deforestation and agricultural expansion. What they seem to fail to link is that such loss of biodiversity was due to the need of land for the meat and dairy industries. So what are the most disturbing and interrelated of planetary trends where the human population of this planet needs to act and promptly and decisively? Well, the use and abuse of chemicals and nuclear technology is the first. The second, the exploitation of the planet's life forms and genetic diversity, including the use of genetically modified crops, the massive increase in human populations, the massive impact of pollution, particularly plastics, the impact of disease, such as on amphibians with Egyptian fungus, fungus. clearly clearing of vast swathes and natural ecosystems, mainly for urbanisation and agriculture, particularly animal agriculture. 
alteration, not loss. So much so that human environments are becoming the place where evolution must now take place. The killing of an unprecedented number of animals through animal agriculture and ecosystem destruction and the interrelated problems of drug trafficking and armaments, human trafficking, corporate greed, uh, climate change denial, environmental crime, they're all interrelated. The introduction of non-human animals and plants in areas where they are not endemic. Exposure of humans and other life forms to viruses and diseases as a result of environmental degradation and climate change. And most importantly, the impacts of severe weather events and of a more overarching impacts of climate change. The scientific proof of existence and impacts of climate change is incontrovertible and contested only by those with a vested interest in the continuation of exploitative actions, particularly governments and corporations, but also questionably by many, if not most, people on the planet who continually rely on these exploitative actions. People are either increasingly oblivious to the effects that their actions are having on planetary life and simply deny their culpability to ensure maintenance of their continued misplaced ascendancy in Western creature comforts, or just deplorably believe the absolute lies and fabrications of climate change denialists, silent skeptics, and the interpretations and fat perverted fantasies of conspiracy theorists. Nevertheless, these actions continue, contested by many, but remain largely unchecked. Even after the many world accords have been ratified or not, the time to act has become increasingly more urgent. So much so that the urgency to respond to climate change is in fact altering how we value what we have left to recover. So what impacts does climate change have on the planet? Well, most discussion is usually centered around those impacts on human systems, including perceived direct human impacts, access to water, agricultural impacts and food production, economic development, social justice and equality implications, social dislocation and the flow on effects of human migration, human health, and the direct impacts of severe meteorological events. Probably not surprising is the disturbing trend of how climate denialists and establishment politicians are now using weather events to argue against sustainable energy production and infrastructure in favour of a continuance of climate impacting thermal energy production and coal mining, of gas and oil drilling, even the expansion of a combustion engine car industry, of course. And most importantly, in the long term, climate change also directly impacts all of Earth's natural ecosystems and biomes. We are all aware of the scales of impact from the melting of ice sheets to extinction of species such as the first climate victim, Bramble K. Millimese, as you see here, a native Australian rodent from the Torres Strait between Queensland and Papua New Guinea. The greatest manifestation of the impacts of a warming planet is the changes that may occur in climate climatic and natural systems that, if exceeded, will trigger large-scale changes in the overall planetary system. Crossing a threshold in one part of a climate or ecosystem may trigger another tipping point into an irreversible new state, such as the melting of a permafrost leading to the release of stored methane, thereby increasing global warming, as would the destruction of tropical rainforests, or melting of the ice sheets leading to rises in sea level or increased drought leading to uncontrollable wildfires. These potentially cascading tipping points must be avoided at all costs. What results is irretrievable, as can be seen in the recent Australian, Siberian, Amazonian, and the recent US wildfires. But what does climate change actually do to the planet, to humans, to nature? What are the impacts? Well, the first is plant extinctions that have the potential to potentially or even exponentially exacerbate species extinction cascades. Ecosystem changes related to changes in water and ice availability, temperature fluctuations, light availability, and respondent changes in life cycle periodicity, desertification and increased heating regimes in the mid latitudes. Species range restrictions that can decrease species survival, such as the polar bear or penguins or montane species, increase risks and impacts posed to human and natural ecosystems from freak weather and natural events, such as mudslides and tornado, tornadoes, cyclones, hurricanes and storm surges, decreased economic resilience, 
environmental uh, resilience in specific natural environments such as coral reef bleaching and death and well sometimes you might get some coral reef expansion in other places which of course leads to destruction of other environments in that local vicinity impacts upon po pollinators particularly insects like bees that are more susceptible to change more so than birds and bats that have a more varied dietary regime and the absolutely massive implications on the for production of food for all of the residents increased risk of disease factors such as the spread of ticks and Lyme disease increased incidence of mosquito-borne viruses or viruses released into the environment from ecosystem destruction or needless consumption of wildlife and we know what that can do and uncontrollable wildfires across the planet in various environments Using the recent Australian black summer bushfires as an example of what might occur when climate change impacts become manifest and the impacts are staggering. The bushfires started as a result of lightning strikes, some subsequently through more than a doubling of pyrocumulonimbus storm events only with only a limited number through accident or arson. The fires occurred in all Australian states and territories, but mainly impacted New South Wales, Victoria and the Australian Capital Territory. The fires lasted the longest in New South Wales from July last year to March this year. It is recognised that the fires were enhanced due to the inextricably linked climate change events, including drought, record-breaking heat, including 50 degree days, that's 122 Fahrenheit, and a positive Indian Ocean Dipole, which is an irregular uh, oscillation of the sea surface temperatures uh, in the Indian Ocean. It's important to note here that the positive Indian Ocean Dipole also caused multiple cyclones in East Africa, floods in Indonesia, and subsequent East uh, African locust plagues. The fires burnt out nearly 19 million hectares, that is over 46 million acres, including 21% of all Australian broadleafed eucalyptus forests and significant pockets of rare rainforests. The largest fires of several hundred that burned was the Gospers fires mega blazing off west of Sydney, destroying 500,000 hectares or 1.25 million acres, and the Duns Road Green Valley mega blaze in the western Kosciuszko Mountains, destroying 600,000 hectares or 1.5 million acres. 34 people died directly, and at least an additional 417 from smoke inhalation. 3,500 human homes were lost and over 6,000 other buildings. Over 3 billion vertebrates were killed, mainly reptiles, with greater than a 90% loss of wildlife from the fire ground, directly by being burnt or from smoke inhalation or subsequent dehydration and starvation. Many trillions of insects and other animals perished. At least 50 native species are now at risk of becoming threatened or extinct, and fire damaged some priceless Aboriginal rock art. In many places, the Australian rangelands, forest wild wildernesses have been obliterated, as we can see here, an image uh, from Victoria. They left half of the ecosystems of Kangaroo Island destroyed, with at least two now extinct invertebrates, and wiping out most of the glossy black cockatoo and Kangaroo Island donuts. Kangaroo Island is an island off uh, Australia's largest island, just off South Australia. The Darnart is a critically endangered marsupial about four inches long. Before the fires, there was an estimated population of less than 500 individuals, but there have been a few limited sightings made recently, luckily. But food sources, mainly insects, are extremely limited. So what else did the, the bushfires do? The Black Summer bushfires, as they are now known, have cost the Australian economy over 100 billion Australian dollars. It spurred a Federal Royal Commission, albeit limited, to examine causes, impacts and avoid avoidance mechanisms. This commission is ongoing and will have a major impact on public policy for decades to come, even if it does not create a better climate change initiative. Politicians have mixed and usually negative responses due to their indifference to climate change, their lack of action or outright naivety and stupidity. Many, like the Australian Prime Minister, received much verbal abuse. Over half a billion Australian dollars was donated from Australians to a relief effort 
and for wildlife recovery. It is the impacts on animals that struck a chord with most Australians, leading to people opening their wallets. And a warning, there are some heartbreaking images that follow. The countless loss of life on the environment is immeasurable. It is not just the individual animals, animals that lost their lives, like this kangaroo. The problem is exacerbated by large swathes of forest having been decimated. The problem does not necessarily lie with regenerating forests, as Australian forests are genetically in tune with regular burning. Sure, some threatened plant and animal species have become extinct in areas where they were known to have ex existed. However, the area that a bushfire burns has an important and lasting influence on post-fire recovery. The larger the area that is burnt, the further an animal has to travel to recolonise a burnt forest. Some are more vulnerable, such, such as the koala. Koalas do travel, but are la largely sedentary and tree-bound. In small areas that are burnt, Koalas can recolonise and maintain a population. However, as such large areas have been burnt, including many known koala habitats, then the likelihood of recolonisation and survival becomes tenuous. When one adds the impact of roads, land clearing and urban creep, then the koala is headed for extinction. Of course, koalas and many other Australian vertebrates were rescued and cared for by a growing number of, of caring Australians, as we can see here one of many images uh, that you can uh, get from the net. <laughs> Two examples are the near extinct inch-long northern corroboree frog, as we can see here. Another is the stocky galaxia. The impact of toxic runoff has been significant. With all of Sydney's water supply impacted and now needing extra filtering, and even marine reefs impacted near Sydney and along the New South Wales south coast. Of all the three billion plus vertebrates, species killed by the forest. Reptiles were the most impacted, mainly due to their great numbers, with 2.5 million animals killed. Here we see a carpet python burnt, but still alive. Another, an eastern dragon killed by the fires. The impact on animals was not limited to wildlife. Many thousands of domesticated animals were killed or maimed, such as this sheep. Many thousands were shot by farmers on welfare grounds. This has also led to a major psychological problem for farmers and their families. But the impact of animals has not been limited to the bushfire season. State forestry departments supported by right-wing conservative politicians are cutting down forests for timber from those forests that, have, that are the last remaining haven for the endangered animals, like the koala. Further, state wildlife and environment departments and local councils are now, now laying 1080 baits to kill what they term as fit pest or feral species, such as cats and foxes, in policies akin to some form of nativism or right-wing power trip. Arguments used to justify the killing state that resident cats and foxes are moving into the fire grounds to kill uh, the survivors that would other recolonise recolonise those areas as if cats and foxes were somehow not impacted by the fires. This is fake news spread by conservation biologists, conservationists and scientists that should know better. However, the indiscriminate killing spree naturally also impacts native animals, including dingoes. Other native animals impacted by baiting include many meat-eating birds and marsupials like the quoll and marsupial mice. The killing has also seen the shooting of horses, deer, pigs and goats. Turning to the dingo for a moment, the authorities justify the killing of dingoes by labelling them as wild dogs, individual escape dogs that have bred into wild populations. However, they do not afford any support on their protection elsewhere and shrug off any suggestion for the need for doing so. They fail to count that so dingoes exist in different numbers. This is of course, satisfies, satisfies sheep and cattle farmers who label all dogs in Australia as wild and in need of eradication. Granted, some species have had enormous impact on the potential survival of wild populations. Cats, foxes, dogs, rabbits, rats and mice have all impacted greatly on them, endemic populations. The scientific evidence for this is also irrefutable, but unfortunately the situation is becoming more complex and dire as the, the effects of climate change exacerbate and as, for example, 
the impacts of the Australian bushfires have, has shown. But some environmentalists and conservation, conservation biologists need to look long and hard at the science they use to justify their populist fake news quips. Nonetheless, the one task that the majority of people agree on is that much more needs to be done on to protect wildlife. Greater funding for universities for animal law, animal studies and wildlife degrees to expand our knowledge base, to better protect critical habitats and species threatened with extinction, fund specific translocation and species expansion project, projects, rethink emergency responses to wildfire events in relation to wildlife, especially threatened species, R rapidly expand funding for wildlife rescue organisations and hospitals, and most importantly, bring animal protection into the climate change debate. Finally, I would like to leave you with some images of wildlife rescue uh, in Australia and the efforts made during the black summer bushfires. Most of the images are of Australia's iconic species, but very, very uh, uh, relevant to what has ensued. Here we have a uh, slide of a rescue of a koala on Kangaroo Island. Here, uh, koalas have been collected by students that drove around Kangaroo Island, placing injured and uh, sick koalas, bird koalas in their car. Here we have a hunter, a malacuda in Victoria, a hunter that uh, turned wildlife rescuer. The Defence Force were also very important contributors to the wildlife rescue. Here we have um, a fire uh, officer in New South Wales helping a kangaroo. And of course, the koala hospital at Port Macquarie in New South Wales has been extremely busy. So please enjoy the conference. Sorry for the images, but climate change is important. It's impacting on animals immediately and irretrievably in some instances. So thank you. And I'll pass you over to our next speaker. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the Animal Law Conference. I'm uh, Lisa Benjamin. I'm so pleased to be here with you. I'm uh, really grateful for the invitation to talk to you about uh, climate change and animals in a changing climate. In particular today, I'm going to focus on international environmental law and animal law. So I'm going to cover three major phases in international environmental law. The first is really the beginning of international environmental law. And then I want to move to focus on the Paris Agreement and then look at the relationship between scientific reports with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and their most recent report, which focuses on land, which is the most relevant to animals. The entire topic that I'm, I'm trying to convey is that international environmental law, for the most part, has been very specific. The law has developed in relation to specific treaties, which focus on specific issues, sometimes species, but more often issues. And there really has not been an integration of animal law or even an ecocentric approach to law within international environmental law. So the first phase was the very early days of international environmental law. And we saw some initial treaty making. This was around the 1900s, where a number of countries were not independent. But there were some very specific treaties that were created. They were usually species specific, and they had to do with transboundary migratory species in particular. A lot of them had commercial elements to them. And so for example, then one of the earliest treaties in 1902 had to do with birds useful for agriculture. Again, there's very little um, international environmental law in terms of case law. We saw a groundbreaking case called the Trail Smelter Arbitration. This was between the US and Canada, and it focused on transboundary pollution. And this is an emerging theme in international environmental law. It focuses on transboundary issues, and in particular pollution, and really has evolved over the decades to focus a bit more on ecosystems, but not yet on animals. If we look at a brief timeline of international environmental law, it really picks up steam in the 1970s. So in 1972, there was a groundbreaking conference on, um, in Stockholm called uh, the UN Conference on Sustainable Development. And from there until now, we've had a number of conferences which have looked at sustainable development and international environmental law treaties have interacted with these sustainable development movements. These have been very important in terms of agreeing declarations, which are often soft law and so not binding, but they have evolved a number of principles which are still very relevant today. 
So that moves us to phase two of international environmental lawmaking. And this uh, Stockholm Declaration was formed by the United Nations. So by this time, post-World War II, we actually have a United Nations. And one of the most important achievements of this conference in Stockholm was that it established an institutional structure for environmental law. This is the United Nations Environment Program, now called the UN Environment, and it was strategically placed in a developing country in Kenya. It's not an institution, it's still a program, and institutional environmental issues are still um, plaguing international environmental law. For example, we don't have an international environmental court. The declaration that evolved from the Stockholm conference focused on, the title is, uh, on the human environment. So it was a very anthropogenic approach to the environment. It has 26 principles, which are non-binding. They're often called soft law because so many countries that were independent at the time adopted them and continue to incorporate them into their national environmental law. It's important to note in 1972 that a number of countries were not yet independent. And so we're still in the colonial, moving towards a post-colonial um, era. And so the preamble, which I put in the slide, really illustrates how anthropogenic this conference was. And it reflects the view of the environment at the time. It's not gender sensitive. It focuses on men as a molder of the environment. And really the emphasis is on the environment serving anthropogenic needs. It does not focus on ecosystems, animals, or species. Principle 21 of the Stockholm uh, Declaration was one of the most important, and it illustrates this tension that I'll talk about a little bit later between developed and developing countries, or as we now refer to them, the global north and the global south. In particular, Principle 21 has had an enduring effect on international environmental law. The focus was very much the sovereign right to exploit natural resources, and it's very much related to the preamble of the Stockholm Conference, which is very anthropogenic. Now, the corollary to that, again, within Principle 21, is there is a responsibility, along with the sovereign right, to control activities so that they don't cause damage to other states. And that very much reflects the trail smelter case early on in environmental law was to prevent transboundary pollution. Of course, it's not talking about um, focusing on damage within your own state. The focus is on transboundary. Interestingly, in phase two, between the 70s and the early 90s, a number of conferences proliferated. So the Stockholm Conference was very much the beginning of a lot of multilateral treaty making in environmental law. CITES is one of the most unusual and very species and animal specific treaties that has ever been created. It's unique in a number of ways, particularly that it came out of the Stockholm Conference, but the IUCN was really the driver of developing the CITES treaty. And NGOs are still heavily involved in influencing the operation of the appendix systems. So a species can be sort of uplisted to have more restrictions on trade if it's particularly endangered. It can be downlisted depending on the science and the data. And so that is really one of the few treaties that we have that's very species specific. So it's an important uh, marker in international environmental law, but does not interact uh, very well at all with climate change. That moves us to phase three from the early 90s up until 2015. And the, you could argue, and I hope there is a post 2015 uh, phase, so phase four. And this was marked by a very famous um, conference called the Rio Conference on Environment and Development. And so I put the emphasis on development in the title because it really does focus on economic development and how that interacts with the environment. It was really a groundbreaking meeting in Rio in Brazil, and it developed a number of soft law uh, initiatives like the Rio Declaration. That mirrors the Stockholm Declaration, it's soft law and not binding, but has a number of very important principles that's still uh, relevant today. There were two binding international treaties which were uh, agreed at the time and they're in bold. The most important for climate change is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or the UNFCCC. I've specifically noted here that it only took 16 months to negotiate this treaty, which is groundbreaking for climate change because then it took us another 20 years basically to get to the Paris Agreement, the Kyoto Protocol came in between, but that was really a very, very fast um, effort by developed and developing countries. The other very important treaty that's related to animals and species that was agreed at the time was the CBD or the Convention on Biological Diversity. And this is a much broader based treaty which focuses on ecosystems and biological diversity and not as much on species like CITES does. The Statement on Forest Principles was a non-binding statement that was also agreed by states. So countries were very busy at the Rio Declaration in 1992, and the declaration itself reflects some of the principles in Stockholm and reiterates them, and it also builds on those Stockholm principles. You can see in principle one, very much like Stockholm, human beings are at the center of concerns for sustainable development. There is an entitlement uh, there that nature and the environment is designed to serve humanity. And again, you have the reflection of principle 21 from Stockholm, 
in principle two of the Rio Declaration. It emphasizes a sovereign right to exploit resources. The reason why this is so important has to do with the tension between the global north and the global south. And this was illustrated in a compromise set of principle three and four, which was very important to both developed and developing countries at the time. The global south was very concerned that they retain principle three. This is a right to development. And the idea was very much that developing countries at the time and uh, to a certain extent are still emphasizing uh, economic development in terms of poverty reduction. So uh, states are very concerned with pressing um, needs of their populations and felt that environmental protection was an issue that was basically pushed by the global north and which they couldn't at the time afford. And so this is why there's this compromise language, principle three uh, put forward by the global south and principle four as the corollary from the global north. And so sustainable development is supposed to incorporate um, environmental protection. So this is a very much a compromise language and it illustrates this ongoing divide or tension between the global north and the global south. So we refer to developed and developing countries now more as the global north and the global south because the concept of developed uh, has moral and social um, implications. And so you can see that the global north is really in red. It's not entirely geographically correct. So of course, Australia, New Zealand, there's still the global north and it reflects largely developed countries. The global south is in green, largely developing countries. Although the homogeneity between that group is now obviously very different. So you can have least developed countries which are defined by the United Nations. And then of course you have the large developing countries like the Chinas and the Indias, which have, uh, you know, really are very different than a number of other countries in the global South. So after phase two, we can really see two main characteristics that have developed in international environmental law. There's lots of treaties. So we now have more and more treaties inspired by the Stockholm conference. They're issue specific. And so they will deal with chemicals or species like CITES or biological diversity or climate change. They are discrete institutionally. And so we don't have this overarching environmental institution. Each of the treaties will develop their own secretariat through the United Nations. They'll often have their own compliance regime. They'll have their own technology and financing systems. And so they are all, all very discrete in terms of the issues that they cover and how they operationalize it. It's driven by states. So it's states driven. So every party has a vote which means that all parties who want to sign and ratify it have to come to a consensus. That often means that the obligations are watered down. There will often be what's called an umbrella or an overarching treaty. And underneath that will sit a specific protocol, which it has more detail than the principles in the framework convention. And so we'll look at the UNFCCC. And we also see this general shift away from species like migratory birds and specific uh, species to much more systemic ecosystem-based issues. And of course, these become much more complicated because they involve the economic development of states and reflect the global north and global south uh, dichotomy or tension. So if we shift to look at the climate change regime, we have the UNFCCC from 1992. The Kyoto Protocol is a specific protocol that sits underneath it. The UNFCCC has really important overarching principles. So it refers to per capita emissions. So often we think about emissions per country, but it does think about consumption and lifestyle, which is, becomes important later in the presentation on agriculture. There's a specific reference to historical responsibility. And we know over time that developed countries since the uh, industrial era have emitted most greenhouse gases and have benefited economically from that. And so historical responsibility is very much related to the next bullet point on equity. So the reference in the UNFCCC refers to what's called, there's lots of acronyms in climate change, CBDRRC, which is common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. This idea is that we all have a common responsibility to reduce emissions, but we have differentiated responsibilities in how we do it because some countries are more developed than others. The UNFCCC was also very important in developing what's called the Annex System. So global north or developed countries are called Annex One countries because they are listed in a specific Annex of the UNFCCC. The objectives of the UNFCCC are really important and they do actually mention nature. So we often refer to uh, the objective of countries to stabilize emissions to prevent what's called dangerous interference with the climate system. In 1992, the parties never defined what that was. So they didn't add a temperature limit to it. They didn't add parts per millions of emissions. They just had an overarching definition. And in a sense, this has been beneficial because our understanding of climate science has evolved over time. Importantly, and the objective is also um, an objective to ensure that nature is allowed to adapt. So there's a time element to that, as well as agriculture and sustainable development. 
So the Kyoto Protocol was agreed in 1997, and it operationalizes the UNFCCC. It continues this annex-based system, which divides developed countries with specific targets to reduce emissions. They're allowed to have what's called trading or flexible mechanisms to get there, which is a cap and trade system. But the United States never ratified Kyoto, Canada left, and Japan didn't agree to a second commitment period. And so the Kyoto Protocol really does not govern a lot of global emissions to date. And non-annex uh, non one countries didn't have any specific obligations or targets under the Kyoto Protocol at all, which continued to create tensions between the global north and the global south. So if we look at phase three of international environmental lawmaking, we're really in the 2015 or post-2015 development agenda. It's very much concerned with the sustainable development goals. We had the millennial development goals in 2000, which were supposed to be reached by 2015. We didn't meet them. And so in 2015, we developed new goals, which built on the millennial development goals. And you can see goal 13 is specific around climate action, although it actually refers back to the UNFCCC system. And of course, in 2015, we had the very famous Paris Agreement. So uh, a number of countries around the world decided to agree a new treaty underneath the UNFCCC, which is specific on climate change. It has almost universal participation um, um, of all countries in the world. And this is a map of what it looked like at the end of last year. Although, of course, the United States has submitted a notice to withdraw. The preamble of the Paris Agreement has you know, some great principles, which builds on both Stockholm and Rio. It, it includes the human right, which is the first time that any climate treaty has done that. It has much more specific groups focusing on gender equality, indigenous peoples, migrants, children. And it also specifically includes paying attention to ecosystems. And this is very important for the IPCC and the reports that we see. It looks at oceans, biodiversity. It has this concept of Pachamama from Bolivia or Mother Earth. And of course, refers to climate justice, which is goes back to the tension between the global north and the global south. The parties in Paris Agreement that, who negotiated the Paris Agreement, we actually agreed long-term temperature goals. And that puts more flesh on the bones of that concept of dangerous um, increases in uh, global temperatures. And so we agreed that we would keep global temperature um, averages to well below two degrees above pre-industrial averages. And we would try to keep that limit to 1.5. We'd also try to have net zero. People didn't want net zero in the actual agreement, but that balance is supposed to be net zero by 2015. And this would be based on what countries themselves nationally determine is an appropriate contribution for their country. And so it reflects principles of equity there. So I want to shift now at the end just to focus on the IPCC and its relationship to the UNFCCC. So we have the independent scientific community that's producing peer reviewed reports on climate change. The IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, reviews those reports periodically, and it forms the science policy nexus. So the IPCC reports are referred to the policymakers under the UNFCCC, and in theory, we are supposed to create treaties and agreements which reflect the IPCC reports. And there have been a number of reports over time. The first was right before the Rio conference in 1990, which inspired the Rio Declaration and the UNFCCC. The second was right before the Kyoto Protocol was agreed. And the fifth assessment report was a year before Paris was agreed, and the IPCC is now working on the sixth assessment report. These reports take a long time, they're very complicated, but over time the IPCC has, with increasing confidence, told us that humans are having a, a significant impact on the climate. And in particular, this quote is from the 2014 assessment report, which says that if we continue to do this, the impacts are likely to be severe, pervasive, and irreversible, not just for people, but also for ecosystems. So I have this little chart here, it's called the burning embers chart from the IPCC reports, and I've put it at three, just above three degrees, because that's what the nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement are heading us towards, a future of three degrees, which exceeds our global temperature goal of well below two degrees. And you can see just on the left for unique and threatened systems, the burning embers, purple is the worst, and red is pretty bad, and yellow is moderate, that unique and threatened systems will be the most affected and the soonest um, to feel those effects. And so that IPCC report on 1.5 was really groundbreaking and told us that even the guardrails of two degrees are not safe. So finally, I wanna uh, just spend a few minutes on the IPCC's special report on climate change and land. So the IPCC has these big assessment reports which take four or five years to compile, but they also have the mandate when parties ask them to have special reports. And in this report last year, they focus on land, land use, land degradation, and they found that land use has a significant impact on emissions. So it is both a source in terms of deforestation, and it can be a sink in terms of afforestation, for example, if we actually capture and keep those emissions within biological land-based systems. 
these systems are very vulnerable to climate change and it looks at agriculture, which um, uses you know, a staggering amount of fresh water to produce and a huge amount of that food that is produced through agriculture is wasted. And so methane in particular is a huge greenhouse gas and it actually provides estimates of what these kinds of land use forestry agriculture is doing to our climate. It is producing 13% of all carbon emissions, 44% of methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas, and 81% of nitrous oxide. And so that means that we are producing a huge amount of greenhouse gases from our use of land, particularly in terms of agriculture. It actually looks at ac activities outside agricultural farm gates, and that's five to 10% of total global emissions, mainly in transportation. So that the good news is that we actually have a lot of mitigation potential, particularly if we change our lifestyles, if we change our dietary habits, there's a huge uncertainty in terms of how much emissions that could save by 2050, but it could be a potentially a huge amount. And the IPCC developed these socioeconomic pathways and they're called sustainably focused socioeconomic pathways. SSP1 is where we actually take a responsible development trajectory with lower population and in particular lower emissions of food and waste. And so this is again the burning embers um, diagram, but it focuses on what could happen if we choose different development trajectories. So for example, for food insecurity, if we follow SSP1, which is low population growth, low greenhouse gas environments for food production, uh, much more reduced inequalities, even as the temperatures rise on the left above 1.5, it actually means that the impacts might be less severe if we use land appropriately. SSP3 is business as usual, where we don't take these into account. And even with temperature increases, it's very clear that we will have much more dramatic uh, impacts uh, to humanity and to ecosystems. And so that means that the absence of dealing with agriculture and animals and land-based systems within the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement is problematic because that could be, it's not only a source of danger for humanity and the planet, but it's also a potential source of huge mitigation. So one of the few academic authors who does look at this is Randall Abate and his new book that was out uh, earlier this year looks at this concept of the climate vulnerable as not just vulnerable human populations, but a much more ecocentric approach looking at wildlife and nature. And this is an important and underlooked area of the law. And so I'll just finish on this sort of happier note. Be, just because the international system has not taken into account an ecocentric approach does not mean that national laws are not doing that. We've had a number of cases, and just this is just a couple of examples, where national laws have started to take a much more ecocentric approach, driven particularly by vulnerable communities. So for example, in Colombia, there's this very famous case where Afro-Colombians and indigenous Colombians, through their constitution, fought for something called biocultural rights. This is a new concept in international environmental law, and it this decision granted protection, not just over the river and gave it uh, rights, but really understood in legal terms, the relationship, dependent relationship between these communities and natural resources. And that will of course include all of the species and animals within those resources. 2017, another important case in New Zealand, again, recognized a river as having kinds of legal rights and the idea of a stewardship uh, council to be able to enforce and protect those rights. is really groundbreaking in environmental law and not something that we've seen before. And there's a couple of cases that are doing this successfully. There's some in India and even in New Zealand, there's a new uh, litigation which is suing the dairy industry in relation to its contributions to climate change. So we you know, traditionally think of the oil and gas industry, which has been the subject of a number of pieces of litigation, but in fact, the litigation is spreading out to different industries, which targets agriculture and in, in particular, the dairy industry. So that's the end of my presentation. I really wanna thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to really be invited to this. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the other presentations. Well, hello everybody. And I wanna start by thanking the organizers for putting this event together and making it on this topic. And I wanna thank everybody for being here and, and talking about this. This is an incredibly important topic and interesting and complicated topic. So the more we can talk about it now, the better. So I appreciate your doing this and including me in it. So as Rod has told you, climate change is going to systematically impact non-human populations both in terms of its impacts on species and its impacts on ecosystems and individual wild animals. And so we really need to seriously consider all of those impacts. I think a lot of people now appreciate 
that animal agriculture is a leading cause of climate change. And so we should reduce or end animal agriculture as part of our climate change mitigation efforts. But what these impacts are pointing to is that climate change is also going to be increasing biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and individual wild animal suffering. And so I think we also need to increase our support for animals, including wild animals, as part of our climate change adaptation efforts. So what I want to do in my talk is lay out the basic moral case for assisting and supporting wild animals as part of our climate change adaptation efforts, talk about some of the complications involved, and suggest some first steps that we can take in order to get started on what will ultimately be a massive uh, effort. So I think the best way to start is simply by observing that I think we all agree, or I hope we all agree, that there are at least some cases in which we do regard ourselves as having a moral responsibility to help wild animals and reduce their suffering or delay their death. So I personally think that we have a moral responsibility to help wild animals sometimes, whether or not we are responsible for their suffering. So if you imagine a simple case where you might be taking a walk through the woods and you come across a deer drowning in a pond, deer is drowning in a pond, and you know that you can save their life, you can help them out of the pond without sacrificing anything morally significant, I strongly believe that in that kind of case, you have a moral responsibility to save their life. Now, I know that not everybody agrees with me about that. Many people do, many other people might not. But whether or not you agree with me about that, I think a lot of people agree that when you are responsible for wild animal suffering, at least in that case, you have a moral responsibility to reduce their suffering. So for example, if instead of walking through the forest and seeing a deer drowning in a pond, if instead you build a swimming pool in your backyard and you put a tarp over the swimming pool and then you wake up the next morning and you see that a deer has fallen through the tarp and into the swimming pool, then in that case, I think you clearly do, and I think we would all agree, I hope we would all agree, that you clearly do have a moral responsibility to save the deer. In that case, you're saving the deer is not a matter of your preventing harm out in the world. In that case, you're saving the deer is a matter of you're reducing or repairing harms for which you yourself are responsible or in which you yourself are complicit. So whatever our moral framework is, whatever route we take towards this conclusion, I think that we should accept that we do sometimes have a moral responsibility to assist wild animals and reduce their suffering or delay their deaths, either because we can, because we have the power to help them, or because we regard ourselves as responsible and helping them as a way of reducing or repairing our own complicity in their suffering and in their deaths. Now, the challenge in the Anthropocene, the challenge presented by human-caused climate change, is that moving forward, because human activity is systematically reshaping the planet, humans are going to be responsible for, or at least complicit in, an increasingly wide range of wild animal suffering and death. We saw from Rod a lot of the reasons why. Climate change is going to cause melting ice caps and rising sea levels, uh, uh, flooding coastal regions, and increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events like floods and fires and, and hurricanes, regional conflicts over land and food and water, and those are going to have significant direct and indirect impacts on human and non-human animals at the species level and at the individual level. And so if we think that we can sometimes have an obligation to help wild animals, assuming that we can do so ethically and effectively and sustainably, if we think that, and if we think that we can help reduce human-caused climate change related wild animal suffering, ethically and effectively and sustainably, then we morally ought to try to do that. Now, with that in mind, I think we can all appreciate that this would be a sort of Herculean task. It would be enormously complicated. And I think a lot of people are rightly a little bit worried about aspiring to systematically help wild animals in light of our complicity in their suffering in the Anthropocene. So for example, some people might think, that helping wild animals at scale would be too futile to be morally required, or it would be too demanding to be morally required. It would be futile, for example, because for each wild animal you save, you might be subjecting them to a, a future where they suffer even more and then they die anyway. Or for each animal you save, you might be 
causing them to become a meal for some other animal, or you might be causing some other animal to become a meal for them. And so no matter how much good you do, you might do a comparable amount of harm indirectly later on. And when you think about things that way, it might seem completely futile, completely ineffective, completely pointless to invest resources in helping wild animals as a result of the, the harms that they face given human caused climate change. Similarly, you might worry that it would be incredibly demanding. There are billions of humans who are going to need resources as a result of human caused climate change, but there are at any given time quintillions of non-humans who are going to be impacted and possibly need resources as a result of human caused climate change. And so if we really do take seriously the possibility that we have moral responsibilities, not only to humans, but also to non-humans, then we would have to think about how to equi equitably distribute resources and benefits and burdens in society, not only to the billions of humans who need it, but also to billions or trillions or quadrillions up to quintillions of non-humans who need it too. And when you think about those concerns in relation to each other, it might seem overwhelming and it might seem like a bad idea. You might think we would be diverting all of these scarce moral resources to what is ultimately a futile and pointless task that could either do as much harm than good or at least do more harm than good. So I wanna emphasize that I take those concerns very seriously and I think that we should take them very seriously, but I also think that they are not sufficient reason not to consider wild animals and include wild animals in our climate change adaptation efforts. So first of all, while many ways of helping wild animals might be futile and might be demanding, so in other words, they might do as much harm as good, or they might be too demanding, uh, consume too many resources to be morally required, there might be other ways of helping them that would not be especially futile or demanding at all. So basic things that we can do, like adding overpasses and underpasses to our roads to reduce the risk of collisions that harm humans and non-humans, or, or adding bird-friendly windows to cars and buildings to, again, reduce the risk of collisions that harm human and non-human animals, or vaccinating animals to uh, reduce the spread of zoonotic diseases that impact human and non-human animals. These are all ways that we can holistically address human and non-human negative health and well-being impacts in a way that, that benefits us all and is clearly not too demanding, does not involve much sacrifice and, and is achievable and sustainable. And secondly, even with respect to more ambitious adaptations that might currently seem as though they could be futile or could be highly demanding, well, they might not be once we get ready for them. The more research we do, the more advocacy we do, the, the more we learn, the, the more knowledge and power we build, the more infrastructure we build, we might find that some things that currently seem like they might be futile or like they might be demanding, once we prepare for them and once we build the infrastructure for them, they might actually not be as futile or demanding as it currently seems that they are. And ultimately, even if some adaptations do involve some amount of uncertainty or do involve some amount of demandingness, it might be that we should very seriously consider them and attempt them anyway, because we are systematically harming lots of non-human animals. And I think that does give us a responsibility to at least see if we can do anything in order to reduce and repair those harms. And ultimately, if we have to sacrifice a little bit, then so be it. Obviously, it might seem demanding anytime somebody with privilege is asked to give up a little tiny bit of that privilege so that other people can be included in, in our impact assessments and in our policy decisions too. But if we have to give up a little bit of our human privilege so that lots of non-humans have some share in the decisions that we make that are going to be affecting all of us, then I think that we ought to do that. And we can all still have good lives, even if we give up a little bit of, of our current benefits and our current privileges so that non-humans can have somewhat better lives in the Anthropocene. So I think that when we are causally responsible for wild animal suffering, then we ought to address wild animal suffering, assuming that we can do so ethically and effectively and sustainably. And I think that there are at least some cases where we can, in fact, reduce wild animal suffering ethically and effectively and sustainably. And I think that if we lay the groundwork in the right kind of way now, we might discover that we can reduce a lot of wild animal suffering ethically and effectively and sustainably. And so I think that we have a responsibility to try. Now, that raises the question how we should try. 
assuming that we should try to do this at all, how should we go about trying to do it? What kind of framework should we have in mind? So what I wanna do with my remaining time is suggest a general framework for thinking about our responsibilities to wild animals as a result of human-caused climate change. And then I wanna suggest some concrete steps that we can take towards acting within this framework. So the main thing that I think we should do, the general thing that I think we should do is take the frameworks that we are already developing in the human case and simply extend them so that they also include non-human animals. So take as an example, what I think is a really useful and generative framework, which is the idea of a Green New Deal. So when we talk about a Green New Deal, what are we talking about? So, so roughly speaking, the Green New Deal is an ambitious set of policy proposals meant to address social and environmental and economic justice in a holistic way. And the reason the Green New Deal is linking those issues, linking social and environmental and economic justice, is it appreciates or, or its advocates appreciate that those issues are themselves linked. In the human case, for example, climate change is going to directly harm humans in all sorts of ways, for example, through fires and floods and, and rising temperatures and so on. But climate change is also going to indirectly harm humans in all sorts of ways by amplifying existing threats that we already face, like hunger and thirst and illness and injury and, and economic inequality. And, and it will disproportionately impact the most vulnerable among us in those ways. And so what advocates of the Green New Deal appreciate is that if we truly want to uh, empower people to be resilient in the face of climate change, then that not only requires creating adaptations that can protect us from the direct effects of climate change, like fires and floods, but it also requires creating adaptations that can protect us against the indirect threats of climate change, the ordinary threats that climate change will, will amplify. So if we can create systems that will help people to have better access to food and water and energy and housing and everything else that might ordinarily be a problem, then not only will we help them to be more resilient in general, but we can also help them to be more resilient in the face of climate change in particular. I think that is a powerful argument for the Green New Deal. That, of course, along with arguments that we need a just transition from our current systems to uh, ideally just or at least more just future systems. And I think that reasoning, while the details are very different, extends straightforwardly to the case of non-human animals too. So as in the human case, as we have seen, climate change is going to inflict all sorts of direct threats on non-human animals, for example, in the form of fires and floods and rising temperatures, but also all sorts of indirect threats on non-human animals by amplifying existing natural threats that they already face, like hunger and thirst and illness and injury and predation and so on. And the challenge, as we have seen, is that in the Anthropocene, in the geological epoch defined in terms of the impact of humans and human economic activity on the planet, we are going to have a hand in, or at least for all we, we know, we are going to have a hand in a lot, if not most, if not all, of wild animal suffering. And so as in the human case, I think that if we are going to try to help non-human animals to be more resilient in the face of human-caused climate change, that requires not only building adaptations that will protect them from the direct threats of climate change, but also building adaptations that will protect them from the indirect threats of climate change, such as ordinary natural threats like hunger and thirst and illness and injury. So how can we think about doing this concretely? Well, I think there are all sorts of simple things that we can do to start. Obviously, a lot of hard questions are going to follow, both about what the details should eventually be and how we can actually bring these changes about. But here are some simple things that we can do in order to start including animals in our adaptation efforts. Obviously, one thing that we should do, which is more a part of mitigation than a part of adaptation, but we should clearly be doing it for both purposes, is end animal agriculture, end industrial fishing, end deforestation, end the wildlife trade, all of these ways of using and exploiting non-human animals that are contributing to climate change the more we reduce or end those activities, the more we can mitigate the effects of climate change so that there is less that we need to adapt to. But assuming that some adaptation is necessary, here are some things that we can do in order to also include non-human animals in our adaptation efforts. First of all, we can increase support for ethical research about non-human animals so that we can learn more about who they are, 
what they need, not only at the species level, but also at the individual level, and what we can do, especially at scale, to ethically and effectively help them and improve their lives without it backfiring and doing more harm than good somehow. So we can, through humane science, learn more about those basic empirical questions. We can also increase support for animal advocacy. We can uh, advocate for, for caring about our impacts on animals, not only domesticated animals, but also wild animals, so that we have not only the knowledge, but also the political will that we need to act when the time for action comes. Now, in addition to that, we can also include animals in our policy in all sorts of ways. So for example, we can include animals in our impact assessments. When we conduct, for example, environmental impact assessments so that we can figure out what the expected impacts of different mitigation and adaptation efforts are, we can include the health and well-being impacts not only on humans, but also on non-humans, so that we can have a full picture of all of the benefits and all of the harms that each particular option will bring about. And what we will discover is that no option is going to be purely positive sum, purely mutually beneficial. Every option is going to produce winners and losers. But if we consider humans and non-humans holistically, then we can have a full picture of what all of the benefits and harms will be so that we can at least make an informed decision about which future to pursue, which adaptations to pursue. Now, when we do that, we might discover that there are all sorts of ways that we can include animals in our adaptation efforts, for example, by creating jobs that involve um, humane steward ship for, for non-human populations, right? We can employ people to tend to natural environments so that they can tend to the non-humans and support the non-humans living in those environments. We can increase support for education so that people can learn more about what animals are like and what animals need and prepare for those types of humane jobs where people can be living in service of non-human animals. We can include animals in infrastructure changes. As I said before, for example, by building overpasses and underpasses on, on roads and bird-friendly windows on cars and buildings and animal shelters and habitats in urban settings, doing all sorts of other things like that that can uh, make it more possible than it currently is for humans and non-humans to live together harmoniously in a multi-species society. We can also uh, look for ways to increase political representation for animals, for example, by uh, creating animal welfare offices so that there are people who are actually employed and formally empowered in public office to advocate for the interests and rights of animals. And these are just some of the first things that we can do in order to start laying the groundwork so that we can eventually be in a position where we have the knowledge and power and compassion and political will that we need to make informed decisions about how to advance human and non-human interests in the face of climate change. And so the last thing that I will say uh, is that in general, I think even though it might seem more urgent and pressing to consider human interests now and non-human interests later, I really do think that we should consider all of them now. And part of the reason is just straightforwardly practical that we can make the changes that we need much more effectively and efficiently if we make them holistically. For example, if we only have to upgrade buildings once with human and non-human needs in mind, that will be much cheaper and easier than if we do it once with human needs in mind and then all over again in a different way when we consider non-humans too. So I think we have some reason to start considering everybody now, even if it might initially feel a little bit overwhelming to do. I think we can do it and we should do it. And then the, the last, last thing that I'll say is that as hard as this is and as much as it forces us to confront all of the bad things that we've done to other animals in the world, I think that it can help to view climate change as both a threat and an opportunity. Climate change is obviously a threat because it exposes the limitations of our existing conceptual and, and social, political, economic, and technological and infrastructural systems. But in exposing the limits of those systems, it also shows us the need for new systems, new ways of living together harmoniously and sustainably within and across nations and generations and species. It, it is forcing us to fundamentally reevaluate these things that we normally take for granted. And so I think in this moment when we are forced to reevaluate these things, we should take that opportunity and really question it all and ask ourselves if there is a better and more harmonious way that we can coexist, not only across nations and generations, but also across species. And so I hope this can be the beginning of a long conversation that we have with ourselves about 
how we can really take responsibility for our impacts on everybody, not only ourselves, but on everybody. Thank you. So just a reminder that folks, you can submit questions through the Q&A. And we have gotten some questions in so far. And I, I think Rob will be back on camera with us momentarily. Um, but while we're waiting, I'll go ahead and get started with a question for Jeff. And thank you all for your presentations. They were really fantastic, thoughtful, thought provoking, and I think lay a really good foundation for the discussions that we're gonna be having for the rest of the weekend. Um, so Jeff, um, translocation came up in, um, in Rod's presentation and I think really gets at the heart of some of these ethical issues that you were touching on. And it seems to be inevitable um, that climate change is going to call for some translocation, but of course, moving some animals inevitably is going to impact other animals. So I'm wondering how you recommend that we navigate those competing interests. Yeah, that is a, can you hear me by the way? Okay, great. <laughs> um, and thank you again, I should say, everybody for organizing this. This is a fantastic conference and, and session, and I really appreciate it. So um, assisted migration or translocation or however you want to describe it is very complicated in part because as with all interventions, it seems to be really hard to do well. People have tried to do assisted migration and sometimes it works, but sometimes it causes lots of unexpected harms. It can take a lot of time and money to move a species from one space and then safely uh, transport them to another space and then integrate them into that community without having a lot of unexpected impacts on wildlife. And you also have to get buy-in from the local human populations. And those are all very challenging barriers. And what I suspect is that sometimes it might not be the most effective thing that we can do to help animals at scale. And it might expose a tension between people who have a more individual animal focus and collective species focus, because I think assisted migration has been uh, a focus for people who are interested in preserving particular endangered species. But if what you are focusing on is making the lives of individual animals as good as possible, then the question might become less, how do I make sure this particular species continues to exist? And more, how can I create an environment that will be supportive for whatever animals happen to exist here in the future. And then it would be more a matter of welcoming whatever animals happen to come into the environment and making sure that you structure the environment in a way that uh, supports them in living good lives. And I'm not sure in what context, which of those approaches is going to be better. I think it's an open question right now, but I think um, that is the way that we should be asking that question, keeping our focus on the needs of individual animals rather than only the needs of species that we happen to care about. Thank you. Um, Rod, a few questions came in specific about fires. So I wanna ask you to tackle a couple of those together. So the first was um, fire definitely has an, a negative impact on animals. However, there are many species that have co-evolved with fire over millennia. Can you expand on the impact of fire on wildlife broadly? Is it negative or positive, or is it more ma matter of magnitude? And then the other was, what is a good response to those who believe that the recent issues with fire are not related to climate change, um, but more derived from other causes, and that um, these are just passing phases, not again, not climate change related? Well, of course, uh, fire does impact uh, natural environments positively and are expected to uh, impact in ways that support species. Now, for example, the Australian bush, particularly eucalypt forests, need fire to regenerate. That's granted. But it's for magnitude. It's the issue. It's the area and the intensity of the fire that's led to massive change within the environments where the current fire regimes are impacting. So it's the scale and magnitude. Sure, we do need fire in certain environments, but unfortunately, climate change has led to uh, a deepening uh, and worsening of the situation uh, where we are trying to protect the environment. In relation to the second part of the question, it's just climate denialism. Thank you. Um, a question for Lisa. 
Um, you, you highlighted how the international agreements have really emphasized a sovereign right to exploit natural resources. And there's a, a fundamental notion of animals as resources to exploit. And I'm wondering if there are ways in which international values animals in ways that are not just as resources and as something more other than resources. And if you foresee any shifts in that perspective on the horizon. Uh, sure. So uh, I had focused a lot on the climate change uh, treaties because that's, you know, the main treaty that we have. And a lot of the treaties are very distinct. But a couple of uh, international environmental treaties that we have already agreed and we're updating, things like CITES, so the Convention for the International Trade of Endangered Species, values endangered species to protect them just because they should exist. And so that has much more of a value approach to uh, animals and species. And the other one that I mentioned is a Convention on Biological Diversity. And um, that had, in 2010, we had the Decade of Biological Diversity, which had a number of what's called the HE targets, so targets to sort of um, sustain biological diversity just in and of itself. And we were supposed to achieve those by 2020. We didn't. And so, you know, now we're in this COVID moment, the UN General Assembly had a meeting last month where they're thinking of developing a new treaty on biological diversity specifically because we failed with the HE targets. And so we're now in sort of what they call a post-2020 global biodiversity framework that they want to agree. Um, and so there's a tension being paid to it and the COP for that was supposed to be in China but was delayed. And so we've had a number of speakers um, uh, prime ministers and presidents who uh, videoed into that. To, so I think we're evolving in the international environmental law, but just to be clear, it's all based on national law. So international environmental law gets agreed because nation states want it to be, get agreed. And there we're seeing the most progressive changes. So the cases I mentioned in Colombia, across developed and developing countries, Colombia, New Zealand, um, we're seeing much more rights of nature being agreed and that may evolve into, which obviously will include the animals in, the, in those areas that may evolve to include specific animals as well. So we're seeing some change. Thanks. Um, a few questions have come in for Jeff. Um, so one was, can you share more ideas for inspiring compassion for animal welfare and eco welfare? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so I think in general, that it really helps to take a very holistic and structural approach to these issues. And so while of course we should be making the types of infrastructure changes that I talked about, we also need to be doing basic education and advocacy. And I think that that needs to run quite deep. So for example, I think in addition to including animals in education and advocacy more than we do, we should also be working to make education more holistic so that people who are being trained for any particular profession have some content about animals. And this actually relates to a different question that Kelly asked in the Q&A, which is about whether architecture students should learn about these issues. Yes, I think all students should learn about these issues. Everybody should learn about how their work, their intended line of work could impact humans and animals and the environment. And, and that requires in general making uh, academic uh, programs and centers, disciplines, less uh, disciplinary and more multidisciplinary so that we can be doing much more of that interconnected work. And then similarly with advocacy, we need to stop doing single issue advocacy or animal advocates advocate for animals and, and then human advocates advocate for humans and environmental advocates advocate for the environment. Everyone in every movement should be making an effort to learn about the, the needs of individuals uh, uh, advocated for in other movements so that we can be doing our work in a way that stands in solidarity with other movements. And so I think the more we can encourage people in education and advocacy mm -hmm. to take that more holistic and multi-issue approach. Uh, we can we can make a lot of progress for getting people to care about animals by seeing the connections between human, animal, and environmental issues, and because they learn more about animals in their own sake. Um, so we had a question come in, which I'll ask Rod first, but maybe if other if we have time, others could weigh in. And that was, do you see a role for animal welfare political representation in efforts to incorporate um, animals into climate change policy and policy making, um, like the animal welfare parties that are cropping up in Europe? If so, how best can they represent animals' interests in a way that is not paternalistic? Uh, yes, animal protection and animal welfare should be within the political debate. However, I do not agree 
uh, that single issue political parties have a place. I believe that uh, these issues need to be very much placed within the ambit of current political parties or even new but broader political parties. The issues need to be recognised uh, as intersectional and I think better placed within a more pluralistic political framework. Thank you. I, we're actually out of time. There's still many questions, many great questions that came in. Um, so I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Thank you so much for joining us.